Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction House, taking a look at some of the guns that they're going to be selling in their upcoming February of 2017 regional auction. And today we're taking a look at an 1867 pattern Verndal breech-loading rifle. This is the first purpose-built breech-loading rifle adopted by the Austro-Hungarian military, and it's right in this time period where everybody was starting to adopt uh, self-contained metallic cartridge breech loaders to replace their old muzzle loading rifles. Now in a few countries uh, they would go with needle fire paper cartridge guns first, like France and Germany. Other countries like Austria-Hungary and the United States would go straight from muzzle loaders to center fire metallic uh, breech loaders. Now the Austro-Hungarians did some really extensive trial and testing and evaluation of different rifles that were available at this period and they came very close actually to adopting an early version of the Remington rolling block. Now the Remington would go on to be an extremely successful design worldwide, primarily for countries that weren't quite big enough to have their own domestic arms production and they needed to buy from somebody. Well the rolling block was a cost effective, simple, and very popular rifle. So much so that even in Austria-Hungary where they did have the ability to make their own guns domestically, just as a matter of national pride. Well, they almost adopted the rolling block anyway. Ultimately though, they didn't. It appears there was kind of a little bit of political intrigue in the trials, and when Remington was getting close to winning, someone brought up some rumors that maybe it wasn't safe, and well, you know, who knows about those Americans? We don't know what they're going to try and pull. Uh, and the Verndal, uh, actually designed by two guys, Josef Verndl and Karl Holub, had a chance to, to kind of worm its way into the competition and ended up winning. It's not a bad rifle. It has this interesting, kind of unique uh, drum breech system, which we'll take a look at in just a moment. Now as it was originally adopted uh, in 1867, this rifle fired an 11 by 42 millimeter rimmed cartridge, black powder, uh, lead bullet, it fired a 308 grain bullet at about 1430 feet per second. That's uh, 20 grams at like 436 meters per second. Yeah, again, pretty reasonable, black powder, full power military cartridge. What's interesting, uh, among many things really, is the carbine version of this, which was adopted, actually used its own separate cartridge. Now in the United States, for example, the carbine version of the Trapdoor Springfield did technically use a different cartridge, but it was the exact same case, it just used a lighter powder charge. Well, the Austro-Hungarian Empire had an actual shorter case cartridge. The, the carbine version of the original 1867 Verndal used an 11 by 36 millimeter case, which as a secondary interesting side note was also used in the Montenegrin pattern ginormous gasser revolvers. They used the Verndal carbine cartridge. Kind of a neat side note. At any rate, we're, we're running astray. Let's take a closer look up at, up at the details of this drum breech system. So these rifles were updated later, and I want to point that out now because the original 1867 pattern has a side mounted hammer like this, where the later 1878 pattern guns have a hammer that's mounted inside the lock. So with that in mind, knowing now that we can recognize the 1867, we're going to snap this back to half cock, and then to open the breech, just take this big nice finger tab, rotate it over, and we now have a cutaway in the center of our drum. That allows you to slide a cartridge into the chamber here. There's an extractor right there on the left side, and the drum breech is spring loaded. It's actually this semi sort of triangular extension is part of the drum, and what looks like a tang here is actually a flat spring that's putting pressure on it. So it holds it kind of in this open position, and if I pull it farther over, you can see that I am activating the extractor. So when you open the breech, you open it forcefully all the way, and it should kick the cartridge nicely out of the breech. You then release it under its spring pressure. You can slide a new cartridge in there. It'll sit on top of the extractor, and then you just close that over. Once it's rotated over, it is now effectively and solidly securely locked bring the hammer all the way back, and then you can go ahead and pull the trigger and fire. Like a lot of these sorts of rifles, the firing pin goes all the way through the breech, and you can see it exposed right back here. When you do fire, that's what the hammer is going to hit right there. Poke it all the way through into the primer and fire the cartridge. 
Notice that the hammer also goes into the back of the breech. It's going to prevent the breech from opening as a safety measure, so the gun the, can't unlock uh, while the cartridge is in the process of exploding. You can see the spring in action from the back when I open it. See how it's being pushed down there. Now, in 1878, uh, when these guns, when the locks were modified and modernized and updated to correct some reliability issues with the gun, they did also actually change the cartridge. So they went from an 11 by 42 up to an 11 by 58 millimeter cartridge. They actually left the muzzle velocity exactly the same. Uh, stayed at about 436, or I suppose 438 meters per second, like 1430 feet per second, but they increased the bullet weight from 308 to 370 grains, just to make the weapon a little bit more powerful. Uh, the existing stocks of 1867 guns uh, had their chambers reamed out for the new cartridge, and the sights replaced. The original guns had a sight that went up to 1400 paces, it's a pretty basic ladder sight. You've got the, uh, the battle sight there, and then to go out a couple hundred yards there are steps built in right here, and you can slide this slider up to do that. And then for seriously long range, you lift the whole thing up and use the notch in the slider. The front sight is a very simple basic post. And we do have a bayonet lug here on the side of the barrel. These were equipped with a saber style of bayonet, fairly typical of that time period. This particular rifle is marked 868, so 1868 for its manufacture, and then Verndal, and ST70, indicating that it was actually formally adopted by the military in 1870. One more cool feature here, and this you'll find on most of the Verndal rifles that are out there, the butt plate is actually unit marked, so that would have been probably from when this rifle was issued out to the reserves, like the Landwehr, and honestly I don't know exactly what that translates to in terms of what actual unit had this rifle, but it's fairly common to see that marked on the butt plates, and that just gives them an interesting added uh, historical element. So in Austro-Hungarian service, the Verndal here acted as a replacement for both the Lorenz uh, muskets, muzzle-loading muskets, and also the Wanzel uh, rifles, which were conversions, breech-loading conversions of Lorenz muskets. When they had a uh, built-from-the-ground-up breech loader in the Verndal, it was uh, sufficiently superior to replace both of those guns that came before it. And it would last until 1886 uh, when it, in turn, was replaced by the first of the straight-pull Monlocker rifles. Now ultimately, it's really interesting that this is the rifle that would be largely responsible for the emergence of Steyr as a main major successful company. Uh, Josef Verndl's father actually was the fellow who had founded the Steyr factory in Austria, and when this rifle was adopted by the Austro-Hungarian military they ordered 600,000 of them, which allowed Josef Verndl Jr. Uh, to capitalize and build up a large factory infrastructure to support, to uh, manufacture these rifles and Steyr would uh, never look back from there, and they're still a large mainstream firearms company today. Another interesting, just a, a story about this particular example of a Verndal, and by the way, one should never buy the story when one's buying a gun. Buy the gun, and if there's physical evidence of the story, great. If not, always view it with uh, a grain of salt, but in this case I think the story itself is just interesting to hear. Um, uh, reportedly, this rifle is one that came from what was called the Verdigree National Guard, uh, out of a town of Verdigree, Nebraska. Apparently in late 1917, and by the way this is, I think today the town has something like 500 inhabitants. Um, it was a small farming town, actually a lot of Czech uh, settlers there, Czech immigrant settlers, and didn't have a whole lot of, of industry or economy, not, not exactly a booming town, but in 1917 they did have a couple of grain mills and they had a mill, or a couple of um, grain elevators and a mill, and apparently the federal government bought the wheat that was stored in the grain mills from that year's harvest and decided that it would buy the services of the local mill to grind that wheat into flour. 
And the town, uh, uh, this seems like this was a major development for the town. This was going to be a big economic boost for a lot of the people in the town. And so they got together and they organized the Verdigree Home Guard to make sure that nothing happened to those grain elevators or that mill while this sale was in progress. Presumably under the notion of German spies or uh, other ne'er-do-wells communists perhaps might uh, sabotage the works. So they found 60 guys who were willing to participate in this. They organized them into 12-man squads and would guard these facilities every night. And what did they use for weapons? Well, they decided they, they got together and they all ordered uh, the same guns. They went to the Francis Bannerman Company, which you've probably heard of if you've been watching a lot of these videos or, or researched old surplus firearms bunch. Bannerman was an early military surplus dealer and a massive one operating out of upstate New York. Uh, Bannerman had enough inventory that they could literally, and I think in one or two cases did, provide entire armaments for small South American countries. Everything the military needed, uniforms, accoutrements, rifles, ammunition, the works. Uh, Bannerman could sell you everything. Well, these 60 guys got together and they actually ordered 40 Verndal rifles and 2,000 rounds of ammunition from Bannerman in 1917. So at some point, the Austro-Hungarians had surplused some of these, sold them. Uh, by World War I, of course, these were really, really rear line weapons. They'd been replaced by the 1886 Monlikers and then the, the later patterns of Monlikers, and then the 1895 straight pole Monlikers. So these were pretty well obsolete. They did end up getting called back into some use in World War I uh, for reserves, but clearly at some point before the war they had surplus some of them because Bannerman had some. Bannerman happily sold these rifles to the Verdigree Home Guard who used them to march around patrolling the grain elevators and the mill. And um, clearly they did a good job of it because there was in fact no German or communist sabotage of the works in Verdigree. Anyway, if you'd like to be the next owner of this rifle, uh, take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to Rock Island's catalog page. This rifle is one in a batch of several that are all being sold together as a lot. So you can take a look at the pictures of it and the other rifles and see Rock Island's description and uh, price estimate. And if you'd like to place a bid on the lot, you can do that right through the website as well. Thanks for watching. One last thing that I want to mention before we go is if you're interested in this period of firearm in general, uh, the early black powder rifles, the late muzzle loading revolvers, or even early percussion muzzle loading revolvers. Um, and in fact, if you want to see a Verndal in particular being fired, I would recommend checking out the channel Cap and Ball, run by a very cool Hungarian fellow uh, who does a bunch of shooting and has some great history. And uh, just a really interesting channel, largely dedicated to rifles like this one.